The time was the 19th of October 1944, the place Mabalakat on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. The late afternoon sun was about to sink below the crestline of the mountains to the west of Mabalakat airfield, which formed part of the sprawling Clark Base complex some 50 miles northwest of Manila. Ground crewmen wearing the work uniform of the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Forces scurried here and there like ants, hurrying to conceal planes in revetments before dusk and to carry out attack preparations for the following morning. I was sitting in the airfield command post, an old and tattered tent, talking with the executive officer of the 201st Air Group, 34 Divine Wind Commander Asaichi Tamai. We were discussing the attack plan for the next day, two days before. On the 17th of October, American ships had appeared off Suluan Island at the mouth of Leyte Gulf, in such force as to indicate that a major invasion operation was about to begin. Yet the Japanese air forces in the entire Philippines area had fewer than 100 planes still in operational condition to throw into the breach. What could we do to check the enemy onslaught as senior staff officer of the 1st Air Fleet? I had been sent from the headquarters in Manila to advise the 201st Air Group. I represented the top naval air command in the Philippines theatre, while Commander Tamai represented one of the main tactical forces of that command. We too had been friends ever since our Naval Academy days, and the gravity of present circumstances brought us even more closely together than before. We spoke frankly of the difficulties confronting us, but we were at a loss to hit upon any plan that might offer a way out of the desperate situation. Our gloomy discussion was interrupted by the approach of a black limousine, which came from the highway in the gathering dusk. A yellow pennant fluttering at the front of the car indicated a passenger of flag rank. As we wondered who the unexpected visitor might be, the vehicle came to a halt near the command post, and a stocky figure wearing the uniform of a vice-admiral emerged ponderously without any attendant ceremony, except for the presence of a single aide. We promptly recognised the admiral as Takijiro Onishi, the new commander of Japanese naval air forces in the Philippines. Vice Admiral Onishi had come from Tokyo only two days before, on the 17th of October, to assume command of the 1st Air Fleet, and had barely had time since his arrival to complete taking over his duties from his predecessor, Vice Admiral Kimpei Terayoka. There must have been a host of urgent matters demanding his presence at Air Fleet headquarters in Manila, yet here he was at Mabalakat. A part of the Japanese Navy's 1st Air Fleet, the principal naval air organization in the Philippines at this time. Why had he come? Commander Tamai and I sprang to our feet to greet him. He accepted a chair and sat silently for a few minutes, watching the activity of the airfield crews working feverishly in the fading daylight. Finally, he turned toward us and said, I have come here to discuss with you something of great importance. May we go to your headquarters? It was time to secure the command post for the day. So Tamai and I joined the Admiral in his limousine. The squadron leaders and pilots followed us in other vehicles. Mabalakat was a dusty Filipino town. Its two or three attractive Western-style homes had been requisitioned for use as officer billets. The headquarters of the 201st Air Group was located in one surrounded by a low stone fence. The house was painted cream colour with green trim, which gave a pleasing, homey effect. The outside appearance, however, totally belied the interior. All regular household furniture had been removed, and in its stead folding canvas cots covered all the ground floor area. Flight gear, towels, washing kits and personal belongings were scattered everywhere. More than 30 officers lived in the main part of the house, while the Filipino owner and his family lived in two rear rooms. Though crowded, this was home to the officer flyers of the 201 St. Air Group, on one side of the yard stood two open oil drums, which served as bath and laundry. On the other side, a small outbuilding housed the orderlies. Trees and shrubs grew lush and verdant, and there was a small patch of lawn. All in all, it was a pleasant billet. Petty officers and men were quartered nearby in native homes. These rude dwellings stood about five feet off the ground. Their split bamboo floors, well suited to the climate, were cool at night. The men spread their blankets on the floor to sleep, but unless the cracks between the bamboo strips were very carefully covered, mosquitoes would swarm inside the mosquito nets and make life miserable. 
There was something comical about the helplessness of our veteran fighter pilots when pitted against the attacks of these bloodthirsty insects. When our car drew up in front of the headquarters building, we dismounted and escorted Vice Admiral Onishi inside. While he responded to a phone call which came in just as we arrived, Staff Officer Chuichi Yoshioka of the 26th Air Flotilla and two squadron leaders of the 201st Air Group, Lieutenants Ibusuki and Yokoyama, were summoned. Then the six of us sat down around a table in a small room on the second floor, overlooking the yard. The door leading to the corridor was left open. Darkness hung heavy outside. Admiral Onishi looked intently at the faces around him, as if seeking to read our thoughts. Then, quietly, he began speaking. As you know, the war situation is grave. The appearance of strong American forces in Leyte Gulf has been confirmed. The fate of the Empire depends upon the outcome of the show operation, which Imperial General Headquarters has activated to hurl back the enemy assault on the Philippines. Our surface forces are already in motion. Vice Admiral Kurita's Second Fleet, containing our main battle strength, will advance to the Leyte area and annihilate the enemy invasion force. The mission of the First Air Fleet is to provide land-based air cover for Admiral Kurita's advance and make sure that enemy air attacks do not prevent him from reaching Leyte Gulf. To do this, we must hit the enemy's carriers and keep them neutralised for at least one week. The tremendous importance and difficulty of the task assigned to us were immediately and frighteningly clear. Only if the enemy's hard-hitting carrier task forces covering the invasion plans for the show operation had been completed in July 1944, after Japan's main defence line had been breached by US forces in New Guinea and the Marianas. The show operation was a defensive-offensive plan against the next enemy offensive. The Philippines was the most likely target for the Americans to choose, but Formosa, the Ryukyus, or even the Japanese home islands were possibilities, so all had to be considered. The show plan provided that no matter which area was first invaded by the enemy's main strength, that area would be declared the theatre of decisive battle and all available forces would be rushed there to defeat the enemy. The decision to activate the show operation was left to the judgment of Imperial General Headquarters. That activation took place at 5.1pm on the 18th of October, with the first intimation of the American invasion at Leyte and the Philippines was declared the decisive battle area. Mabalakat could be rendered ineffective for one week, would Kurita's force, which included the mighty battleships Musashi and Yamato, but not a single carrier has a chance of getting through to Leyte Gulf to destroy the enemy transports and thwart the invasion attempt. The whole success of the Imperial Headquarters plan was thus keyed to our ability to fulfil our mission. Show means victory, but if the first air fleet failed, Operation Victory would turn into irretrievable defeat. Yet at this moment, it seemed idle even to hope that we might succeed. In early September, we had been far stronger, but the enemy carrier forces had still been able to strike heavy blows at our bases throughout the Philippines, crippling our air strength. Since we had not been able to stop them then, how could we do it now when the air fleet's total fighter strength, concentrated in the 201st Air Group, was down to 30 planes in operating condition, and its equally meagre bomber forces were dispersed from Zamboanga to central Luzon. True, the show plans called for the transfer of the 2nd Air Fleet from Formosa to reinforce us, but the 2nd Air Fleet had just been through a severe trial in the Formosa air battle against the enemy's far-ranging carrier force. Until it could regroup its depleted strength and transfer to Philippine bases, we stood alone a handful of planes against hundreds. As Admiral Onishi spoke, we sensed that he had come here for something more than just to repeat what we already knew was our mission. The question in all our minds was how we were to accomplish that mission against such overwhelming odds, and we waited for him to provide the answer. I watched the Admiral's heavily lined face as he spoke again. In my opinion, there is only one way of assuring that our meagre strength will be effective to a maximum degree. That is to organise suicide attack units composed of zero fighters armed with 250 kilogram bombs, with each plane to crash dive into an enemy carrier. What do you think? The Admiral's eyes bored into us as he looked around the table. No one spoke for a time, but Admiral Onishi's words struck a spark in each of us. Indeed, 
body-crashing Tayatari tactics had already been used by Navy pilots in air-to-air -air combat against big enemy bombers, and there were many flyers in the combat air units who had urged that the same tactics be employed against enemy carriers. This is perhaps hard to understand, for no man welcomes death. But it is more understandable if one bears in mind that, considering the heavy odds that our flyers faced in 1944, their chance of coming back alive from any sortie against enemy carriers was very slim, regardless of the attack method employed. If one is bound to die, what is more natural than the desire to die effectively, at maximum cost to the enemy? The silence that greeted Onishi's words, therefore, bespoke neither consternation nor dread. It was finally broken by Commander Tamai Yoshioka. Just how effective would it be for a plane carrying a 250-kilogram bomb to smash bodily into a carrier's flight deck? Staff Officer Yoshioka answered, The chances of scoring a hit would be much greater than by conventional bombing. It would probably take several days to repair the damage to the flight deck. Commander Tamai undoubtedly knew this, but asked the question as a means of relieving the tension and gaining time to collect his thoughts. He then turned to the Admiral and said, As Executive Officer I cannot decide a matter of such gravity. I must ask our Group Commander, Captain Sakai Yamamoto, for his decision. Admiral Onishi answered curtly, As a matter of fact, I have just spoken on the phone with Captain Yamamoto in Manila. His leg was broken in a plane crash and he is in the hospital. He said that I should consider your opinions as his own, and that he would leave everything up to you. This brought Tammy to an abrupt realisation of his personal responsibility. I wondered what his answer would be. Would this kindly and unassuming man accept such an attack method? We all turned toward him and waited tensely for his response, knowing that we would be the ones to carry out such attacks. Commander Tamai was well aware of the grave war situation which called for such an extreme measure. He also knew the innermost feelings of his pilots. After a long pause, he asked the Admiral for a few minutes to consider the matter. He beckoned Lieutenant Ibusuki to follow him and left the room. As Tamai later informed me, they went to his room and exchanged opinions about the pilot's probable attitude toward the prospect of crash diving. After hearing Ibusuki's views, Tamai rejoined the meeting and said, Entrusted by our commander with full responsibility, I share completely the opinions expressed by the Admiral. The 201st Air Group will carry out his proposal. May I ask that you leave to us the organisation of our crash dive unit? I well remember Admiral Onishi's expression as he nodded acquiescence. His face bore a look of relief coupled with a shadow of sorrow. Now that crash dive tactics had been decided upon, it was necessary to form a special attack unit at once. The time for action was close at hand. It might even be tomorrow. Admiral Onishi withdrew to get some rest. The historic meeting was over. As soon as Admiral Onishi had left the room, Tamai set to work. From the first mention of a crash diving unit, he had been considering which pilots to choose for such a mission. He had known these young men for many months, on completion of their basic training in October 1943. They had been assigned as fledgling flyers to his 263rd Air Group in Japan. Commander Tamai had held great expectations for them, and he had put his heart and soul into preparing them for battle. Their combat training had been only half completed by February 1944, when these youngsters had suddenly been ordered to the Mariana Islands for regular combat duty. Since that time, from Tinian through Palau to Yap, they had fought continuously and against terrible odds. Many of them had fallen in battle, but the survivors had carried on. During the first week of August, they had been moved to the southern Philippines and incorporated into the new 1st Naval Air Fleet as the 201st Air Group. From his duty as commander of the 263rd Air Group, Tamai had come to the 201st as executive officer. By this time, the 201st was down to only about one-third of its original strength, but the grim experience of battle had refined the remaining pilots in heart and spirit, as well as in skill. They were now steel-fibred veterans, and their morale was high. Commander Tamai, who had inspired them during their training period, and had shared the hardships of uphill battles with them ever since their initiation into combat, was as deeply attached to these men as a father to his children. 
It was his constant desire that these men be of supreme value to their country. The pilots, in turn, felt toward Commander Tamai as they would toward a parent, and expressed this feeling at every opportunity. So now it was natural for him to have them foremost in his thoughts. Commander Tamai, after consulting with his squadron leaders, ordered an immediate assembly of all non-commissioned pilots of the air group. He reviewed the critical war situation when all 23 of the men were assembled, and then explained Admiral Onishi's proposal. In a frenzy of emotion and joy, the arms of every pilot in the assembly went up in a gesture of complete accord. Tamai emphasised the necessity for strict secrecy, and when the meeting was ended, all the pilots retired to their billets. It was past midnight when Tamai returned to the officers' quarters and told me of the pilots' reactions. In Oguchi, he said, they are so young, but though they cannot explain what is in their hearts, I shall never forget the firm resolution in their faces. Their eyes shone feverishly in the dimly lit room. Each must have been thinking of this as a chance to avenge comrades who had fallen recently in the fierce Marianas fighting, and at Palau and Yap. Theirs was an enthusiasm that flames naturally in the hearts of youthful men. Thus, we were assured of pilots for the crash dive unit, to whose leadership should these fine young men be entrusted. We discussed various prospects, and I suggested that the leader should be a Naval Academy man, Tamai agreed, saying that Naoshi Kano would be perfect for the job, but unfortunately Kano was away on a mission to Japan. In deep thought, Tamai murmured, if Kano was only here, several of the pilots had leadership qualifications, but for this important mission we needed the very best. The leader had to be a man of highest character and ability. Commander Tamai wrestled with the problem, and finally settled on Yukio Seki as standing out above the others. Lieutenant Seki had trained for carrier-based bombers, not fighter planes. He had come to the Philippines about a month before, reassigned from Formosa. Commander Tamai, in his preoccupation with the daily task of sending his men off to attack the enemy and of coping with enemy air raids, had had little time to talk with Lieutenant Seki. But as the days passed, the young lieutenant had approached Tamai at every opportunity, fervently expressing his opinions on the war situation and requesting a chance to participate in combat missions. This happened so repeatedly that despite Seki's short time with the group, Commander Tamai decided that this man had something to offer. I myself remembered Seki as a midshipman when I was instructing at the Naval Academy, and felt sure that he would be a good leader. So we agreed completely on this choice, and an orderly was sent to summon Lieutenant Seki. The Philippine night was dark and quiet. We sat silently in the officer's lounge as the sound of the orderly's footsteps faded upstairs. I thought of Seki, deep in slumber, and wondered what his dreams might be. Quick steps soon descended the stairs, and the tall figure of the lieutenant appeared in the doorway. It was evident that he had hurried, for his jacket was still not completely buttoned. He addressed Commander Tamai. Did you call me, sir? Beckoned to a chair, the young man sat down facing us. Tamai patted him on the shoulder and said, Seki, Admiral Onishi himself has visited the 201st Air Group to present a plan of greatest importance to Japan. The plan is to crash dive our Zero fighters, loaded with 250 kilogram bombs, into the decks of enemy carriers, in order to ensure the success of the show operation. You are being considered to lead such an attack unit. How do you feel about it? There were tears in Commander Tamai's eyes as he ended. For a moment there was no answer. With his elbows on the table, hands to his head, jaws tight shut and his eyes closed, Seki sat motionless, in deep thought. One second, two seconds, three, four, five... Finally he moved, slowly running his fingers through his long hair. Then, quietly raising his head, he spoke, You absolutely must let me do it. There was not the slightest falter in his voice. Thank you, said Tamai, simply. Suddenly the oppressive atmosphere was dispersed and a brightness filled the room, as if clouds had cleared to let moonlight burst through. We talked of the next steps to be taken. The discussion was brief, but I observed in Seki's every word and gesture a strength of character which confirmed our choice of him as leader of the unit. With the composition and leadership of the Special Attack Corps decided, I said, 
Since this is a special mission, we should have a special name for the unit. Tamai agreed, and I suggested, how about Shimpu unit? Shimpu is another way of reading the characters for kamikaze. That's good, said Tamai. After all, we have to set a kamikaze, divine wind in motion with it. I went upstairs where Admiral Onishi was resting, to report that the organization of the unit had been completed. I knocked and then opened the door. There were no lights burning in the room, but starlight filtered through the window, and I could see a form on the canvas cot near the door. During the several hours since meeting with us, Admiral Onishi had remained in the darkened room, alone with his thoughts and his anxieties. He arose as I began my report. There are twenty-three men for the special mission, and Lieutenant Seki, an academy man, has been chosen to lead them. Since this is a special affair, we wish you to christen the unit. Commander Tamai and I suggest that it be called the Shimpu Unit. Admiral Onishi nodded his approval. It was early in the morning of the 20th of October 1944, but an announcement was drawn up at once and posted as soon as the Admiral had signed it. In substance, it said, The 201st Air Group will organize a special attack corps and will destroy or disable, if possible, by the 25th of October, the enemy carrier forces in the waters east of the Philippines. The corps will be called the Shimpu Attack Unit. It will consist of 26 fighter planes, of which half will be assigned to crash diving missions and the remainder to escort, and will be divided into four sections, designated as follows Shikishima, Yamato, Asahi, and Yamazakura. The Shimpu Attack Unit will be commanded by Lieutenant Yukio Seiki. In the meantime, Commander Tamai and Lieutenant Seki had continued their talk in the officers' room. They discussed all phases of the operations which might be called for in the approaching daylight. With this in mind, and the hour growing late, Tamai finally suggested that Seki retire to get whatever sleep was possible. Seki's thoughts as he went back to his room must have turned to his widowed mother and to his bride of only a few months. But Commander Tamai could not delve into Seki's private life. At this point, he had to limit his concern to the task at hand and suppress his personal interest in this resolute young warrior. The 19th of October 1944 is a day that I, too, will never forget. As flight officer of the 201st Air Group, I was busily engaged at our Mabalakat headquarters with my commanding officer, Captain Sakai Yamamoto, in the usual pre-dawn preparation for the day's activities. In accordance with the tactical orders for the show operation, which had now been put in motion, the 201st Air Group had the duty of attacking the enemy forces off Leyte Gulf. Day was just breaking when the captain was handed a dispatch. He scanned it and turned to me. Nakajima, it's from Admiral Onishi. He wants us to be at his headquarters in Manila by 1pm. We had no more than realised the importance of this message when the air raid alarm sounded. American planes were striking over Mabalakat in an early morning raid. The ensuing damage and confusion delayed our departure, and it was not until the afternoon sortie had been dispatched at 2 p.m. that we finally left for Manila by car. Being a flyer, I seldom took a long automobile drive. I had flown over the area many times, but had never travelled this route in a car. The many uninhabited stretches of road between Mabalakat and Manila were likely spots for guerrillas to lie in wait, and we were relieved to reach Manila at 4.30 p.m., but we were embarrassed and disturbed to find that Admiral Onishi had already set out for Mabalakat by car. Unknowingly, we had passed each other on the road. The Admiral's reason for calling us all the way to Manila must have been important, and we still had the job of attacking enemy ships next morning as ordered for the show operation. We felt, therefore, that we should get back to Mabalakat. If we tried to return by car, night would fall before we reached our destination, and we would be exposed to guerrilla attacks. So I telephoned nearby Nichols Field and asked that a fighter plane be made ready. With the captain's approval, I planned for us to fly back to Mabalakat. We hurried to Nichols Field and found a zero drawn up on the apron. Mechanics were tinkering with the engine, which did not sound quite right. I ordered a change of spark plugs. When this was done, Captain Yamamoto climbed into the space behind the pilot's seat. I got into the cockpit and gunned the engine. It still did not respond perfectly, but night was fast approaching, and after all it was only a twenty-minute flight to Mabalakat. I decided we could surely make that, 
and took the plane into the air without giving the engine further thought. It was stupid of me to take off in a plane with a faulty engine, however, and I was promptly punished. As soon as we were in the air, I tried to retract the wheels and found that the control lever would not budge. Captain Yamamoto reached over my shoulder to help, but it was no use. We would have to fly with the wheels down. This cut down our speed considerably, but was unavoidable. I circled over Nichols Field and headed to the north. The altimeter registered 400 metres as we started across Manila Bay, and then Vertical Bar smelled gasoline. Gas fumes in an airplane are ominous. They indicate a gas leak, which means that fire may break out at any moment. Just as I thought of this unhappy possibility and tried to decide what to do, the engine suddenly stopped dead. There was not even time to be surprised. I pushed the hand fuel pump and glanced at the pressure gauge. I tried all the switches, I tried everything, but the engine remained completely dead. We could not make it back to Nichols Field, nor could we reach any other airfield. Alternative landing possibilities ran through my mind. It was either the sea or a rice paddy. With landing gear retracted, it would have been safer to land in Manila Bay, but the wheels were still down. If we splashed, I could probably get clear, but Captain Yamamoto, jammed as he was in the back of the fuselage, would never be able to get out before the plane sank. As soon as the engine stopped, I had banked sharply to the right and headed back toward land. I could see the road along the right shore of Manila Bay below. If I tried to land on the road and the plane should veer to the left, we would fall into the sea, and Captain Yamamoto would not have a chance. I decided to aim for a rice paddy. To prevent the plane from stalling, I kept careful watch on my airspeed. At the same time, I tried to loosen the lock pins of my seat so the captain could escape quickly in case the plane caught fire after landing. I managed to pull out the right-hand pin, but my weight on the seat held the left one tightly in place. It was probably fortunate that this pin did not come loose, for if it had, the seat might have wobbled and disturbed my control of the plane. We lost altitude quickly, barely clearing the scattered buildings on the outskirts of Manila. Close below I saw a rice paddy, and then there was a jarring crash as the plane ground to a halt in a spray of muddy water. Miraculously we did not turn over, nor did the plane catch fire. The landing gear broke at the moment of impact, and the plane skidded about twenty metres to a stop. It was a lucky landing. I quickly withdrew the remaining lock pin, removed the seat, and lifted Captain Yamamoto from the plane. His left ankle had been broken in the crash. I luckily had suffered nothing more than a few face scratches. We struggled to the nearest road, and hailed a passing army truck which brought us back to headquarters, looking like a pair of bedraggled sewer rats. It was at headquarters that we learned for the first time that Admiral Onishi's purpose in calling us was to propose the formation of a special attack unit. When Captain Yamamoto heard this from Onishi's chief of staff, Captain Toshihiko Odawara, he immediately telephoned Admiral Onishi at Mabalakat to express his regrets for the forced landing. He added that, although confined to Manila, he was in complete accord with the Admiral and gave his executive officer, Commander Tamai, responsibility on all matters at Mabalakat. I returned by car to Mabalakat early the next morning, the 20th of October, and there found that 24 pilots had been chosen for a unit which had already been named the Shimpu Special Attack Corps. Its members were prepared to sortie at a moment's notice. Commander Tamai gave me details of the selection of Lieutenant Seki as leader, and of the pilots volunteering the night before, and I was happy to learn that the organisation of the special unit had been carried out so smoothly. By the latter part of October, the mornings and evenings are chilly in central Luzon. The Bamban River, which flows just north of Mabalakat, is so clear that small stones in the bottom of the shallow stream are clearly visible from the bank. White plumes of pampas grass sway in the breeze on both sides of the river and are reflected in the water. The graceful scenery made me think of Japan here, surrounded by the pampas grass and close by the stony riverbed that stretches to the foot of the cliffs, were a group of young men whose thoughts at that moment must have also been centred on the homeland, if they had taken the occasion to admire the landscape. They were members of the 1st Special Attack Corps, commanded by Lieutenant Seki. Since dawn of this day, the 20th of October, they had been ready for the call to arms. Eager faces alight, 
They discussed various methods of attacking enemy carriers and the precautions to be taken. Breakfast was announced and they ate, but the meal did not disrupt their animated conversations. As they finished eating, a call from headquarters summoned them to assemble for Admiral Onishi's first and final instructions. The 24 men of the Shikishima, Yamato, Asahi and Yamazakura units lined up, with Lieutenant Seki standing a step ahead of the others. Admiral Onishi looked solemnly at the men before him. He was pallid, and his words seemed slow and troubled as he began to speak. Japan is in grave danger. The salvation of our country is now beyond the power of the ministers of state, the general staff, and lowly commanders like myself. It can come only from spirited young men such as you. Thus, on behalf of your hundred million countrymen, I ask of you this sacrifice and pray for your success. At this point his voice shook with emotion, but he continued, You are already angels, without earthly desires, but one thing you want to know is that your own crash dive is not in vain. Regrettably, we will not be able to tell you the results, but I shall watch your efforts to the end and report your deeds to the throne. You may all rest assured on this point. There were tears in his eyes as he concluded, I ask you all to do your best. I have never heard such moving words. They were not intended merely to incite youthful ego, nor to flatter youthful pride. Japan had in truth placed her fate in the hands of these young men who were willing to die to save their nation. It seemed almost impossible to crush the overwhelming might of the enemy and turn the tide of war. Our situation was beyond human wisdom. Our only chance for a miracle lay in reliance on these youths. At their final briefing, I observed in these men a composure, wind and tranquility, which comes only to those who are aware of their own significance and power. As I watched them go, it was impossible to suppress a feeling of protest against our country for having come to such dire straits, against the spirit of the young men themselves, against Admiral Onishi, and against my own involvement in these circumstances. The high-level background of these bizarre developments is delineated in the diary of Vice Admiral Kimpei Terayoka, who recorded events at headquarters in Manila from the time he turned over command of the first air fleet to Admiral Onishi until Onishi's return from Mabalakat. The 18th of October 1944, show operation activated, time is against us, available airplanes are limited in number, we are forced to take the most effective method to fight in this operation. The time has arrived for consideration of Admiral Onishi's proposal to employ crash dive tactics. Various opinions were frankly expressed. Ordinary tactics are ineffective. We must be superhuman in order to win the war. Volunteers for suicide missions will have to be reported to Imperial headquarters before their takeoff, so that they will feel secure and composed. Should we speak directly to the young flyers or through their group commanders, it would be better for future actions to have their group commanders present the proposition. If the first suicide unit is organised by fighter pilot volunteers, other units will follow their example. If all air units do it, surface units will also be inclined to take part. And if there is a unanimous response by the Navy, the Army will follow suit. After exchanging these opinions, we arrived at the conclusion that suicide tactics were the only possible salvation for the nation. It was decided to let the new commander, Onishi, organise the special units at his discretion. Admiral Onishi summoned Captain Yamamoto, 201st Air Group commander at Mabalakat, and his flight officer, Commander Nakajima, to Manila. When they failed to arrive at the appointed time, Onishi set off for Clark Field at 4pm, hoping to meet them on the way. Sunset was at 6.30pm. Captain Yamamoto, however, arrived at Manila a little after 5pm, having remained at Clark Field to send off the afternoon sortie unit. Yamamoto's executive officer, Commander Tamai, was on hand at Mabalakat to receive Admiral Onishi and to assure him of volunteers for suicide missions. Twenty-four men volunteered for the first assignment and the group was christened the Shimpu Special Attack Corps. It was divided into four units, Shikishima, Yamato, Asahi, and Yamazakura. These names were taken from the Waka, poem by Norinaga Moturi, a nationalistic scholar of the Tokugawa period. Shikishima no Yamato Gokoro Wohito, Tawaba Asahi Niniu Yamazakura Bama, 
The Japanese spirit is like mountain cherry blossoms, radiant in the morning sun. Admiral Onishi was pleased to find that Lieutenant Yukio Seki, an academy man, had jumped at the opportunity of leading the corps. The Admiral returned to Manila from Clark Field on the evening of the 20th of October. He was enthusiastic in talking about the Kamikaze Corps. The flyers are eager and have formed a good outfit. They asked permission to work out the organisational details by themselves, and I approved. Onishi relieved me of command at 8pm. I sincerely wished him good fortune with the new tactics, and he pledged his best efforts to achieve success. If on his return to Manila from Mabalakat, Admiral Onishi's face bore a look of grim determination, it was understandable. Relieving Admiral Terayoka, he knew that his only hope of opposing the mighty enemy task force lay in the chance that the unprecedented tactics he sponsored might prove successful. First Air Fleet Headquarters was in a two-story house, not far from Nichols Field, in the suburbs of Manila. On the first floor were two large rooms which served as the mess hall and conference room, and several smaller ones where the orderlies were quartered. Upstairs a bathroom and five good-sized rooms served chiefly as the sleeping and living quarters of the 1st Air Fleet Commander and his staff officers. The yards, front and back, were small, but in each was an air raid shelter. The structure itself stood out imposingly from surrounding homes. Its owner had been man of means, and the contents of his bookshelves identified him as an intellectual. Next to the house was a building that apparently had been used for playing high ally, and adjoining it were a number of hastily constructed barracks for enlisted men. One of these barracks served as the communications centre. A paved road and a breakwater separated these buildings from the sea. Standing by the breakwater, I could look westward across Manila Bay at the antenna towers and chimneys of Cavite and beyond. Slightly to the right of Cavite appeared Corregidor, in the middle of the bay entrance. Separated from Corregidor by a narrow strip of water, the Mariveles Mountains loomed from the southern tip of Bataan Peninsula. Near at hand, the Manila Hotel's hulk rose at the southern end of the city. Facing the sea, this building added a touch of strange modernity to the scene. Nearer still, at the foot of Legaspi Wharf, stood the former U.S. Army and Navy Club, now the headquarters of the Japanese Southwest Area Fleet. With the setting sun, the reddish glow of the western sky shaded into purple and then with the mountains, islands, ships and buildings into deepening grey. Watching the sun set behind Mariveles, silhouetted against the sky, I thought of the day's momentous events and of the cycles of history that had transpired here, and most especially of the abrupt change of circumstances that had brought Japan to the crisis that she now faced. It was here at Manila Bay, almost fifty years earlier, that the American Commodore George Dewey had given his oft-quoted order, You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. His action led to the capture of Manila, and added to the US Navy's tradition of decisiveness and courage. More recently, this place had seen momentous action in the opening battles of the Pacific War, Japanese naval air raids, mopping up operations on Bataan Peninsula, and the attack on Corregidor. American and Spanish warships had come and gone in these waters, upon which now floated the ships of Imperial Japan. These mountains had looked on complacently, as General MacArthur had given up hope of defending the Philippines, boarded a small patrol boat, and escaped to Australia. Victory for Japan followed shortly in the Philippines, as it did throughout vast areas of the Pacific Ocean and its islands, extending from the Solomons to China, and from Australia northward. The Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942 had brought Japanese military expansion to a stop for the first time, and Nippon was handed her first thumping defeat a month later in the Battle of Midway. But these checks did not prevent the establishment within the area of conquest of a great defensive perimeter, which had suffered no major blow from the enemy until February 1944, a bare eight months back, when the Americans had occupied the Central Marshals. After our loss of the marshals, the Japanese High Command had set up a new absolute defence line, stretching from the Ogasawara Islands, through the Marianas and the Western Carolines, to Western New Guinea. This line, the Army and Navy decided, would be defended to the death. Yet within four short months after the capture of the marshals, 
the very centre of this line had crumbled. Our naval air forces, which at the beginning of the Pacific War boasted absolute mastery of the air in all theatres of battle, found that from the middle of 1943 their zeros were inferior to the new F-6F, F-4U and P-38 aircraft from the United States. As a result, lacking even minimum requirements of pilots and material, our air forces suddenly found themselves fighting against impossible odds. Not only was there no better plane to replace the zero, but the supply even of zeros was insufficient to fill half the requirements of the fighting fronts. The gradual retreat of our forces from the Solomons, followed by the loss of the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, and the eventual withdrawal of our naval air forces from Rabul itself, had all resulted in the final analysis, from the inability of our air strength to hold its own against the enemy. The enemy's advance into the Marianas in June 1944 had led to activation of what Japan called the A operation. This was an all-out effort to prevent penetration of our defensive perimeter. Vice Admiral Kakuji Kakuta's land-based first air fleet, and pronounced AH in Japanese and usually called AGO, meaning number A. Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa's mobile force there had sought and achieved an engagement with the enemy, but the long-sought encounter had resulted only in a crippling of our own fighting strength. In the two-day battle of the Philippine Sea, 19 to the 20th of June, Japan had lost three aircraft carriers and more than 400 planes and pilots. Upon retirement from this action, there was not a single organizational unit left intact. To cope with the situation following our defeat in the A operation, our naval forces in the Philippines area had been reorganized. In the Philippine Sea engagement, the 1st Air Fleet, main strength of the Japanese Navy's land-based air force, had lost half of its planes and men based on Tinian and Guam. The forces that remained were completely reorganized at the end of July, when the decision was made to transfer this organization to the Philippines. Command of the 1st Air Fleet, which had been directly under Combined Fleet, was now placed under the Southwest Area Fleet. The commander of the 1st Air Fleet, Vice Admiral Kimpe Terayoka, was supposed to effect the speedy transformation of Philippine training fields into frontline air bases, but local deficiencies were too numerous to be overcome. Shortcomings were particularly apparent at bases in the central and northern Philippines. To facilitate tactical operations and simplify the problems of training and maintenance, it had been decided to abolish the former system of small air units and form a large unit organisation based on plane types. Thus, all fighters were organised into the 201st Air Group, all bomber planes into the 761st, and all night fighters and reconnaissance planes into the 153rd. When Admiral Terayoka arrived in early August, 1st Air Fleet had 257 fighter and bomber planes and 25 transports, and there were some 18 Army reconnaissance planes placed under his command, for a total of 300 planes. Owing to inadequate maintenance and upkeep, however, so few of the Navy planes were operable that even the task of defensive air patrols had to be entrusted to Army units. Through a concentrated build-up programme, Admiral Terayoka had been able in the intervening months to bring his air fleet up to 500 planes, of which 280 could participate in tactical operations. However, the number of combat-ready planes had been cut in half by American striking forces, which threw heavy air raids at Davao on 9 to the 10th of September and at Cebu, Legaspi and Tacloban on 12 to the 14th of September. And the 21 to the 22nd of September raids on the Manila area had inflicted still heavier losses. By the end of the month, Admiral Terayoka had only about 100 operable planes left in his entire force. Our greatest shortcoming had been in the establishment of air bases. The confusion following the first air fleet reorganisation, the change in naval policy regarding the use of land bases, the dragging negotiations with the army for the use of its bases, and difficulties of transportation were all factors which contributed to our lack of preparedness. The Navy's sorry air strength was further handicapped by the miserable condition of the land bases. At the end of August, the Navy's best organised bases had been at Davao and Cebu. Early in September, however, 
Enemy attacks with land-based B-24 and P-38 aircraft from Moratai had mounted until it became impossible for us to station an air unit permanently in the Davao area. There were no nearby bases to which the planes could be transferred, and as a consequence the Navy had to use some of its planes to fight off the enemy task force, while the other planes moved to rear bases. In mid-September, it had been decided to hasten the build-up of Clark Field facilities, and vast quantities of supplies were channelled there. But the sands of time were running out, and when the second air fleet was transferred to the Philippines toward the end of October, bases there were still in a most unsatisfactory condition. It was for this reason, principally, that our land-based air forces were so slow to act, and were later so ineffective in the battle for Leyte Gulf. As far back as late 1943 and early 1944, even while the Navy still had air forces at Rabul, certain of the pilots, worried over the inferiority of our strength, had started to consider suicidal crash-dive tactics. Ensign Ota, who later proposed the Oka special attack plane, was one of these men. Nothing is more destructive to morale than to learn of the enemy's superiority. Following the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June, the inferiority of our naval air strength had become even more marked. Captain Aikiro Gio, who commanded the light carrier Chioda of Vice Admiral Ozawa's Carrier Division 3 in the June battle, analysed our fighting strength after the battle, compared it to the enemy's, and submitted to his superiors the following opinion. No longer can we hope to sink the numerically superior enemy aircraft carriers through ordinary attack methods. I urge the immediate organisation of special attack units to carry out crash dive tactics, and I ask to be placed in command of them. Captain Gio, who had served as a naval attaché in Washington as well as naval aide-de-camp to the Emperor, continued as Chioda's skipper, and in that post was to participate in the battle for Leyte Gulf as part of Ozawa's main force. On the 25th of October 1944, the day the first kamikaze plane crash-dived into an American ship, the Chioda was attacked and sunk by American carrier-based planes, and Captain Joe went down with his ship. But meanwhile, his ideas had been taken up by another officer, equally dedicated. In the summer of October 1944, Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi had been Chief of the General Affairs Bureau of the Aviation Department in the Ministry of Munitions. In that position, he was fully aware of our inferiority in aircraft production capacity as compared to the enemy, and could see the dismal prospect. He gave serious consideration to opinions and suggestions from the fighting fronts, since he was seeking a solution to the future role of naval aviation in the steadily worsening war situation. Early in the war, as Chief of Staff of Naval Land-Based Air, he had exercised personal command in air actions in the Philippines and in the sea battle off Malaya. From such experiences, the Admiral now knew that with ordinary tactics, Japan no longer had any chance of stopping the American forces, let alone defeating them. Hence, he was influenced by the opinions of Captain Gio on the 17th of October, the very day that Admiral Onishi arrived to take up his new post in Manila. The spearhead of the American invasion forces had landed on Suluan Island, at the entrance of Leyte Gulf. In the forefront of the invader, his great carrier task force rampaged about the Philippine seas like a mighty typhoon. To the rear stood the American invasion armada in full array, ready for the reconquest of the Philippines. Thus, the fateful day of the 17th of October had marked a new and graver crisis in the war situation for Japan, a situation far different from that of early October 1944. I was suddenly startled to find that twilight greys had darkened into night. My brief musings had spanned from memories of the glorious past to realities of the ominous present. Heavy of heart, I left these reveries to return to headquarters and the problems of the hour. In my position as flight officer of the 201st Air Group, I knew better than anyone else that the Kamikaze Special Attack Corps had not sprung full-blown overnight. I knew that it was but the climax of an ever-ascending fighting spirit in men finally confronted with insuperable odds. For I knew that this build-up of spirit and dedication had already manifested itself long before any kamikaze units were ever organised. For instance, on the 21st of September, 
The month before, when hundreds of enemy airplanes bombed and strafed Manila all day, 45 fighters of Rear Admiral Masafumi Arima's 26th Air Flotilla at Nichols Field had attacked them and shot down 27 enemy planes, with a loss of 20 of our fighters. And on the following morning, Lieutenant Usaburo Suzuki had led 15 fighters of the 201st Air Group in a sortie against the whole gigantic US carrier force itself, making five direct hits and shooting down three Grumman Hellcat interceptors against the loss of only five of his own planes. But long before that, as early as midsummer, the high morale of the Japanese pilots had been demonstrated in another way. This time it was the development of the technique of skip bombing by fighter planes. At that time, August 1944, the 201st Air Group fighters were supposed to be working with the 761st Air Group bombers. The 761st possessed 16 Type 1 Betty and 35 Tenzan Jill bombers, but less than half of them were operational, and most of the pilots were hopelessly inexperienced. These two air groups had been coordinated with the idea that fighters would escort the bombers to their targets. But a fighter plane unit, which is used only for interception or bomber escort work, cannot remain at peak efficiency, no matter how high the morale of its pilots, and the pitifully few bomber planes we had would be ineffective against the mighty American task forces.